Um, so I was taught to talk about latest QCD for EIC physics. And as I was sitting down there yesterday, I know you guys learned so much about EIC. So I'm going to just really focus on about the latest QCD. And I was talking to some of the students, like I know some of you heard about it and you seem to be like a distant mm -hmm. object. So hopefully my goal today, just to you know, that the latest QCD is not that scary and it's something not that far fetch. Um, so, Okay, so hopefully we will get to that. Um, so, but when I like to think about the topic uh, with, with the EIC physics, I think this is probably some of the slogan I heard from other people using them, right? Really just really probing the heart of the matter, right? So we study a, a lot about the nuclear protons and all that. And so with the latest QC, what we do differently is our tool in say our giant collider is a bunch of supercomputers. And that's basically what we do with it. And so um, before we move on, I would like to talk to you a little bit about myself. Uh, so I heard a lot of people were like getting to know each other in the school, getting and asking all the lecture about how they get to become physicists. And so, so I was kind of um, putting a few uh, info here in case we didn't have a chance to talk about that. Um, so I actually found a small town in Taiwan. And every time I mention Taiwan, there's always some people haven't heard about it. It's actually a very small islands uh, right on the coast of, of the China, and it's actually a different country on China. And you might heard about it being mentioned every now and then there's a, some sort of tension going on. And I'm not from most people heard of Taipei or Kaohsiung, some of the really big city of Taiwan actually from somewhere, not so far away, but it's a very small town. For a long time, it was really hard to get to Taipei. And only recently there's a highway, and so on, um, so it become really convenient. But as such that I actually don't know much about business and science for a long time until I go to school and all that, right? And so uh, my preferred pronoun is she, her. And so I got my uh, PhD at Columbia University, just right in New York City. I heard some of you go in there on Saturday. You should go visit if you have a, have a chance. The uptown is very nice, small, but very nice complex there. And then, so one of the drawbacks of living in New York City for so long is ever since I have been living in other part of the US and then you can, it's a little bit cultural gap for me. And, and so I was in Virginia and I picked up, you know, bird watching, I need to have something to fill out my weekends and all that. I moved to Seattle and the Bay Area for the while, so the West Coast, I'm used into never seeing a, a drop of snow most of the time until I moved to Michigan. Then I got, everybody was worried about getting tenure in the first year. I was worried about how am I going to survive the snowstorm. And yeah, actually, turn out wasn't that bad at all, especially if you have a husband who do most of the shuffling. And, <laughs> and I just need to you know, go out and do other things, but it's not too bad. And like a lot of women in physics, I also marry somebody who also had a physics PhD. And so, so, you know, we are, and I'm really glad in, this summer school, I see so many female students here because in my time, I often find myself going to a workshop meeting. I'm the only woman in the room. And some, I don't know, sometimes it can be a little bit strange in a way, but I'm really glad that we have really good uh, composition here. And then I do, uh, because of that, and then with, with the latest QCD, because of the combinations of theoretical physics and computing, both subfield are not very diverse. So you can imagine the marriage of that, it's even worse. And as such, like, sort of start a bunch of uh, diversity activity because of that. Oh, right, sorry, yeah. So that's my husband, you can tell the, oh. You can tell the physicist with his crazy hair. <laughs> <there. laughs> and uh, then we had two girls. And, and then before COVID, we used to have like this Nobel Prize uh, special, you know, colloquium that would bring, our kids there, even though they have no idea what they are. <laughs> and I was doing a bunch of uh, like women in late excusing activity. And then there's IPS also had this idea. Uh, they were, if you haven't heard about that, it's a really nice idea, right? So it, um, idea. Uh, so, so what they do is, you know, instead of a lot of our community facing similar problem, right? So instead of reinventing the wheel, doing everything from scratch, you create this network that we have, not just the Olado University or collaboration or uh, US lab that or in the network you can share information, you know, say I'm trying to get to our department head with these issues, you know, and then somebody was like, oh, we've done that. And that's how you do, how we go around, you know, 
different labels or different department of policy and how you get something work and, and so on. So it's a very nice uh, resource. Even though sometimes they send out so many documents, I didn't have time to read to all of them, but there are a lot of resources you, uh, to do all those things. And, um, right, oh, shoot. Okay, sorry, that didn't work. All right, sorry. Ah, oh, I see. Okay, anyway. <laughs> So, um, so a lot of people are asking me about how I become this is how I get to do things like this QCD. It sounds weird to some of you, I know. And so I actually go, I actually went to grad school trying to become a condensed major experimentalist. And the reason for that is that's sort of the only thing I know when I was undergrad. A professor come to me and say, Oh, do you want to do something? I sure I have nothing to do this summer. So I just went to a professor's lab and do something. But Anyway, so long story short, it's sort of like I, I come across it. And I realized I, I didn't really like to be a experimentalist, uh, just kind of not my calling, I guess. And so I was talking to other professors in the department, mm -hmm. and I talked to my this uh, thesis advisor who was really enthusiastic about this QC. I kind of just got drawn into that. So there are a lot of random things that happen in my life that lead to where I am now. And so as such that, uh, so uh, anyway, so, so then I'm, right now I'm doing a high performance uh, supercomputer to study the, mostly study the property of the quality and on the hard drive. And many of that is sort of, I kind of have a hand of that and can do it slightly better than other people. And that's what a lot of the stuff I'm doing. And so uh, because of my own story, um, I sort of, uh, I think a lot of you were asking similar question, right? How do people physics become who they are? And so I was working with uh, a number of students in MSU. So we started uh, my journey as a physicist podcast. Uh, so we basically interview uh, different physicists and especially try to find out how they become physicists, right? And how they become doing what they were doing. And also talk a little bit about research and, and what they do outside of physics in general. So I, I will fix the, the QR code later on the on PDF. But on this, yeah, so that doesn't actually go to our uh, latest website, unfortunately. Yeah, so if you can take a look, so the, the latest season, it's, uh, it's about this ongoing thing that's happening uh, in the nuclear physics community. So I don't know, some of you probably heard of this thing called long range plan. Uh, so it's something that happened every, usually supposed to be five years, but it's like seven to eight years of uh, uh, these days. And so my student Bill, who's here, he's the host for this season. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Okay, I'm not really good with this technology thing. Um, Right, so um, so we have a uh, uh, right now we have our ten episode. We can plan to interview a couple more people as the long range plan kind of develop and all that. And so here's the we open the season with the next lecture, uh, Gail Dodge um, about the long range plan. So if you are curious about how, what's happening, what have been doing, so this is kind of following the plan. So there are a few things that they were talking about at the time, but uh, but generally you can learn a little bit about what people do and how they become physicists in general and so on, right. So now back to the, uh, probably the heart of the matter, right? So this is something that everybody know how to do since you are infancy, right? We all smash things. And as you get older, you make a lot of thousands of friends, they can build like the world's largest machine and smash for Nobel Prize. Um, so, so this is one of the things. and. And obviously the EIC have a very different specific setup that can actually help us understand some of the matter that sometimes you can look, you can find them in the LHC, right? So I was going to originally, I cut down a lot of slides because they are a lot more nice uh, introduction that was given by other lecturer. But uh, this website, if you haven't know about them, I actually have a, a few of the general intros if you want to. You know, if you're working on this particular business, you want to talk to your friend about roughly what you were doing, that could be a useful way. So there are also a bunch of really, very nice white paper. I, I saw Todd mention and other literature also mentioned a lot of them. I'm just not going to list all that. There are a few ones I, that I liked, particularly like this 2012 one, because that was our chair, Alexi, who's not here. <laughs> he was one of the big players in that original 2012 one and then lead to a lot of active development and, and so on. And then up to the, the big giant yellow report. And then there are also some long, long range of playing white paper talk more about 
uh, the QCD and then focus on quite a bit about ESC as well. Right, so I'm now experimentalist. So what I do is I kind of just try to study the same thing, but I'm using some of the world's largest supercomputers. So that makes you know kind of cool. And so the supercomputer is really just a lots of lots of CPU or GPU sort of combined together. And they are like skyscrapers. Every now and then there will be everybody is competing to be the fastest computer. So you have center around the world competing for that. And then people build their own specialized machine just so that they can, you know, get better performance and all that. And then there are a few examples like Japan, and this is in US. Uh, it's probably not the most fastest one now yet anymore. So every six months they will update and, and then, then people are competing and there are a lot of application and people are doing various different things, uh, not just classical computing on that. Right. So, so here's the online of my two lectures. Uh, so first I want to give you some motivation about why this QCD is interesting and why we are doing this and a little bit about how to do our calculations. And, and I will try to give you a few examples of that. Uh, some of the simple things that what we call low hanging fruit calculation that mainly just kind of give you some idea of how, how we do some of this and maybe understand some, if you went to a workshop conferences and there are some latest people talking about something that you will be able to ask, send intelligent questions, hopefully. And then later two, could be getting a little bit more, uh, oops, sorry. Uh, and we get, it was getting a little bit more on what's happening in the latest uh, developments. And so in the last, last about 10 years or so, there have been quite a bit of the uh, X-dependent mm -hmm. pattern distribution function that's uh, coming from latest QCD calculation. So we can talk a little bit about that and some of the application to what we call uh, generalized pattern distribution, and which is uh, one of the hot topics for EIC as well. And then a little bit about what are the challenges and future prospects in that? All right, so this is the famous standard model mark that everybody saw so many times, right? That's what we spend all of our life doing. <laughs> and then, so on top of that, this is QCD, really just focus on really subsets of that, right? So we mostly deal with the quad in the gluon section. And we, the most important quad player in our game is aqua dumb question sometimes charmed and then they, they the up and but the top button tend to get too heavy to play an important role in the structure but we do also study a lot of botanium uh, uh, spectroscopy as well right so i would use some of this uh some of this notation later on as i introduce some of the result right so the qcd really just sort of uh studying the strong interaction of the quads and gluon, and we study SU3 gauge and, and all that. And um, so one, sure this is, this is um, okay. All right, all right. So you're supposed to have a video, but I don't think it's working. All right, never mind. I, I will just skip that. So later this ad, later you see that on my, uh, slice titles, I put some of the picture there. So it's basically tell you how to uh, build a lot of hard drums from some of the simple QCT rules. And so I have a trailer here, but it's, it's okay. Okay, all right, sorry. Okay, it, it doesn't have some, okay. Oh, maybe, yeah, it's just yeah, I'm not not. <laughs> All right, never mind, sorry, that's not worth it. Anyway, so it's a very simple game. Uh, so you teach it, teach you like color, degree of freedom, uh, quad flavors. And then as you move on, you're gonna introduce ring. So you got to know uh, anyone who had, I don't know anybody heard about Candy Clash. I guess, are you guys too young to heard about Candy Clash? Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> so it's a game that's so addictive uh, that a lot of people are playing Candy Clash. Yeah. And so this game is very much like that, but in QCD flavor. So if you like Candy Crush, give it a try. Or you, you know your mom, grandma, somebody <laughs> who knows that. And they, you know, you can talk to them about QCD about this. After, afterward, they will tell to you, oh, do you know about the Sigma variants? <laughs> All right. Anyway, so one other thing I find really interesting is QCD. Is so, you know, well connected to our life, but people don't hear about it, right? You only learn about QCD when you go to grade school. You don't talk about that. 
before that, right? And then there are so many, why we is this and a lot of other things all related to QCD. And I find that sort of, you know, quite strange as I learned about these things. Anyway, so they were just a, uh, oh, right. So, so this is, uh, so when we do some of the outreach event, this is my daughter teach my thesis advisor how to play the QCD game. So I really love this picture. <laughs> anyway, and then there are some uh, things we do we get related to that. Okay, all right. So, so then, so as you as guys also see a lot of this picture, so the QCD is, uh, it's different because the strong coupling constant itself, it's a function of energy, right? So at the large energy, you get, the constant get a lot smaller than we, you know, we physicists like to do perturbation calculation, you know, expand things in some orders, right? And this is the natural constant to do. So we have done that. And then these three uh, gentlemen had to take, uh, take back the Nobel Prize for proving the assembly freedom in this case. Uh, but there are a lot of still physics that haven't been studied that's in the lower energy region, right? That's where we come in. A coupling will get a lot stronger and you cannot just use those traditional, typical uh, theoretical anal analytic tools anymore. And that's become interesting. And so why is this low energy region of the QCD interesting, right? So there are a lot of things we can learn about that. And a lot of them we're going to talk about uh, today is about the, the, we want to know what's the origin of the quota mass, right? So that was one of the big questions. How does the spin um, add out to be one half in photons? And we want to image the photons and learn about pattern distribution function. And we also want to know more about the structure. So because we, everything we measure on Earth is still nuclear and proton, right? That's elements that you can touch. And as a result, that this a lot of this concept become really important if you want to study new physics. You need to understand the detector, which is made of atom and nucleum and so on, the property of that. So you need to reduce those precisions, right? And actually, some people are actually studying the nuclei and try to understand why we exist, right? So this this everybody know about how the carbon can become so abundant, become we have so so much organic life and all that. There's an intricate of the the binding energy between, you know, the uh, a bunch of different nuclei to make that chemical reaction happen so frequently, right? And there are some people in our fields actually trying to tune what if you were, we are living in the universe, we have different strong coupling constant, different QVD constant, different masses, right? And you can actually see there's some sort of spatial balance to, to live in that particular universe we have. That, that's why we exist. So study some of this binding energy is also some of the big topic. And they are actually also uh, astronomical um, applications. For example, things like neutron star, nobody really understands what's going on in the center mm -hmm. for that neutron star. And then every few years, people will study, oh, the neutron star radius is and, and as a function of masses is somehow bigger than what we think they are, right? And another old model is having the wrong understanding about what's happening inside. And some people suspecting there might be some sort of strange uh, stable baryon that's interacting inside the center of the neutron star and so on. So, so there are a number of people study like equation of state and or try to play it around maybe different strains of hyperon. Hyperon is not something we can measure very well uh, because they decay so fast. And I think people haven't done experiment on that because of safety or other reasons. And so they, a lot of experiment was done like eighties or something, and it was so, you know, uh, emphasized, right? And so, so we can study these things like property related to the hyperon and hyperon neutron scattering and all that kind of thing to to help narrow down the equation of state as well, right? And but then. Of course, they have <clears throat> difficulty in low energy. Otherwise, all this physics would be done already, right? We won't be here talking about this. And so just imagine that this, the thing's complicated, right? You are, we won't do the physics courses. Everybody tell you, you always start from, always start from Guang state, right? The Guang state for classical physics is easy, right? It's sort of just vacuum, nothing, right? So you just build on top of that. But with the QCD, it's a, actually a dynamic change. You can have all the C quark, in the, back, in the vacuum, they pop up and in the line, they interact with the gluon, they can have infinity amount of quark anti quark pair, right? So just describe your very simple nothingness, right? The vacuum or the QCD is, is not a trivial text, right? To do it right, and it's really complicated, right? And then this is why 
um, strong, strong implication kind of spatial is difficult, right? And so we would like to be able to, you know, kind of play around this region and, and see what we can do with that. And that's how kind of how VTC QCD kind of come in. So the basic idea is sort of like, we still start with the same process. Like this is a picture of Feynman, you can put, yeah, not quite clear, oh, some sort of Feynman diagram, right? You have an idea or observable that you are interested in, right? And then you kind of, using translate that into some code and then you put it on supercomputer and then we solve the problem kind of blue false way. So that, that's a general cartoon idea. One question. Yes. So when you say the analytic calculations are impossible, you mean uh, from like one Fermi and longer, whatever that boundary is that you told us about. Right, so, so that's a very good question. Uh, so I think people are sort of debating about where is the non perturbative region and the perturbative region comes in, right? So, so we all like, I think George talked a lot about perturbation, right? The same thing, right? There's a certain scale, you separate perturbative and non perturbative quantity. I think it depends um, on the observable you are interested in. They have, they will, you are interested in studying certain observable that has smaller uh, short distance behavior than yours non perturbative and perturbative region might be different. Here I'm thinking about roughly a Fermi, also that kind of scale. And so, uh, yeah. So, so yeah, that, that was, that's a good question. And it is tricky. And sometimes there are theories that work better than we, we, we think they should fail, but somehow still working pretty well in, in some cases. So, so it's, it's really hard to know. And this is why I'm not advocating saying, you know, we have to do everything related to QCD. I hope you guys don't, Take it away about there, right? There are a lot of different theoretical tools. Everybody have their own region. Later, I'm going to tell you a little bit about. There are things that latest QCD is good for. There are things that quantity want to look at. It's really painful to look at latest QCD. If you have better, other better way to do it, go for it. If not, um, yeah, there, there are people working on problem that are going to lay out for at least a decade also to be able to solve those issues as well. So, so they, they are like. And, and they're not easy answer to, to any of that, yeah. Okay, so then, um, so, so Wilson, I, I don't know how many of you heard about him in the classroom. Uh, so in the about late 70s, he proposed this idea of introduce additional cutoff scale that we latest view call this latest spacing, which is the smallest resolutions. Um, the latest calculation, right? So basically what we do is sort of, you take, um, maybe this, this might be a better picture, okay. Right, so basically you take an observable of your interest, in, right? So they are very different thing we are interested in. And you are supposed to like a field theory that you take out a bunch of path integrals. You have gluon fields, you have anti-quark quarks, and you have some, actions or the, composed by the gluon and fermions and then the observable your interest, right? So instead of doing all this thing in Minkowski space, which, which is a lot of our classes tell you to do, we are doing this in Euclidean space. And the differences of that is the Minkowski is complex. You, you work with a complex number and in Euclidean space, you only work with the real numbers, right? So what all you take is a very simple weak rotation to rotate imaginary time to real time. Now we're dealing with just all real numbers and that's what computer like, right? Real number, you can do very different trick with that, right? And so, so we like the continuum QCD, we also have quantum masses, right? That's part of the fundamental parameter in the standard uh, model Kofima, right? And but in, in our case, we can actually vary them and we do vary them, right? Uh, so the quantum mass is, is a, a cell, it's a scale dependent quantity as well, right? It's so not easy to talk about quantum masses. So instead you hear latest people talk about higher masses, right? Higher mass is something that there's a relation between the quantum masses and pion mass, but you don't have to worry about which scale or the pion mass you are talking about and all that, right? So it's just easier to describe that. And we all know the physical pion mass is at 140, right? On the latest calculation, we can say the pion mass to be heavier 
And the reason we're doing that is it's just computational, much cheaper to do so. So what, why do we do that? We do that when we explore. I have this new idea. I don't know if it's going to work or not. I don't want to spend 10 years to find out or it fail immediately, right? So I do a calculation, really, really heavy pile mass, maybe one GeV, so it's almost 10 times heavier. So I can get that number very quickly and see whether it's in the right magnitude, for example, right? And so, so that we kind of play trick like that a lot. And, and sometimes there are times that we, there are some quantity doesn't converge very well at, when you get really, really light. And so what people do is, well, maybe we do somewhere between 500, 400, 300, and 200, right? So it's like you do the calculation multiple times, but still, and then you do like a extrapolation. Uh, there are something that you can uh, try to extrapolate that. And then that sometimes is still cheaper than you calculate them directly on physical quantity, right? Uh, directly a physical pound mass. So, so they are things like, and they are quantity, I'm going to show you later, that like they actually can allow actually quite a number of a calculation already directly calculated the physical power mass. And there were just a few more challenge carry, uh, quantity we had to calculate much heavier ones. So, so power mass is one of the things we want to think about, right? And we had to have an ultraviolet color, right? That's in my bowl, that's basically what Wilson introduced. So we have this smallest scale of the uh, distance scale on the latest, right? So we introduce a line, say, oh, continuum, you can imagine the our world is a continuum, right? It's, but on the latest, we have this. So if anything can be only units of the, such a scale, right? So that becomes the sec, sec of the, uh, the UV color, the theory, right? You can imagine I can vary them, right? I can give it small, I can give it big, right? But just like, you know, uh, just like you think about you want to describe a good picture or something, right? You all, of course, you want to improve your resolution, right? It would be like, if your latest spacing is too large, you'll be like, you're looking at the discretized picture, which is really terrible, right? And it really depends on, again, what you want to study. Sometimes some quantity you want to have, a, we already know very well, we want to input a precision, then it's necessary to go to much smaller latent spacing. There are quantity that's less sensitive to that, and they maybe can get away with not so small latent spacing. But ideally is to study multiple different latent spacing and do an extrapolation, so we actually get to that continuum limits, right? And then uh, because we tried to put the problem on supercomputers, we had to worry about degree of freedom, right? The com computer is great, supercomputer is even better, but still, right, there's a limitation of what they can do. And so we had imposed a, what we call infrared cutoff, right? So basically, it's the biggest distance of the system, right? So you have a four dimensional boxes to contain this, say, if I want to study four times, right? I, so I have that, I create a four dimensional box. They had to be big enough for me to study them, right? Sometimes we know how big we should be. Sometimes we don't. So you study multiple boxes to see how much that quantity changes the size of the boxes, right? And so typically with the, so such a, the, the boxes can be, depends on how light the clock, uh, the pile mass that you use in the calculation, right? So you can imagine the lighter the pile mass, you know, Think about it like uh, the wavelength, right? The matter wavelength, right? The, the object would be fluffier, kind of be everywhere. So you need a bigger box. If the pile mass is really heavy, like say one GeV, and then that means that everything is really, you have very small wavelength, you can probably get away with just one Fermi box, right? So typically, so there's some relation between the pile mass and the boxes. Usually the rule of down is about roughly and pi times L become a dimensionless quantity about four or so. So that kind of, uh, at least nobody has seen a like, huge problem with such a combination of that. So it, it's, uh, this is all uh, a little bit technical there, but at the end, uh, so what you want to know is, so you can, we can do a calculation. We can have different pile mass, some lazy spacing and volume, right? At the end of the day, if we can prove we want to recover the what we call physical continuum limits, right? You want to take the quantum mass to physical pile mass if it's not directly calculated over there. We definitely have to take latent spacing to zero or study the dependence, for example, because we there's no way we can calculate A to zero, right? Or you can get it really small. And similarly, the value, we have to make sure that that's big enough so that you get the right physics. Yes. 
uh, that is uh, spacing A um, like, uh, closer to zero, implying that now you are considering the, the lattice as a point. Um, right. So, yeah, so there's a fund of there's some sort of divergence issue as well if you go A to zero. So, you, you are approaching the zero, but not directly at zero. Yeah. So, you always calculate finite latent spacing. That's right. You take that limit. And so this is actually not so trivial as well. I have, I don't want to get into a, a lot of that. It depends on the quantity you calculate. And because we have, we introduced this scale, right? So they are quantity that's proportional to A, right? In principle, I can introduce my fermion actions. I can have a order A turn and order A square turn and it all go back to the same derived equation in the continuum, right? They are the same equivalent. So I can do all that. Right? And people do do all that to improve some of the quantity of the fermion actions. And so in principle, you can write down a lot more combination of that. And same thing with observable, right? But you can also have things that can be proportional to one over A, and that could become a problem, right? So, so it's actually some of the quantity I will talk about probably tomorrow called moments, some of the moments have that kind of problem. It's actually, actually we look at the, we analyze with the dimension uh, you find out they are proportional to one over A and you can take this particular limit, right? So you have to look for other uh, operators to, to pick up uh, various different things, yeah. So it's not, it's not trivial, yeah? Every time we take limit, field theory is kind of like that, right? It's, it's never been easy and direct, unfortunately, yeah. Yes. So your computer, how much is L, six or what? Uh, so it depends on the, Depends on the pile, physical pile mass. If we calculate a whole thing at physical pile mass, right? So ideally, it would be about six Fermi at least to be to be good enough. And it, it really depends for nuclear quantity, right? And so so that that varies, yeah. And then if we want the latent spacing to be small, I mean, we will have more, you know, degree of freedom. So the increase, the the com computational increase. If you just want to say save the resolution by two, you can imagine, right? It's a four dimensional, that's at, at least a, a, a magnitude of A, least, assuming everything just linear scale, which again, computational wise, not always the case. So you can looking at from one year calculation to 10 year calculation by just going to, you know, closer to the continuum limit, right? So there's a lot of choices that latest people have made, right? You had, you want to do a good calculation, but you can also wait 10 years, you can wait your you can go your request to you need to get them off five years or, or sooner, right? So, so there are a lot of things that you have to worry about. Yeah, and play the head as well. Right. Okay, so, so this is happening around for a while. And then every now and then people will come to us like, why, why this QC haven't saw the QCD yet, right? You have been doing this for so long. And so one of the obvious reasons is definitely the computational resources, right? When Wilson first introduced such idea, the calculation people are doing at a time is like four latest side, you know, sometimes two, three, and then eventually four dimension or four latest side, right? And then it, it got like maybe a couple of Fermi latest spacing. So that's really terrible calculations. Pretty much where we are when we do when people try to put latest theory on the quantum computing right now. That's a, we don't have enough Q gate uh, to do those calculations. So you can only do very small ones. That's pretty much where we are in the 80s, right? And so at the time, yeah, we don't have enough powerful computer, right? So this is kind of the state of the art game. Anybody here play computer game? Yeah, uh, that's what they play, you know, and this giant computer take up most of your desk and all that. That's what they play. And to you know, today, this is probably a few years ago that you can, you know, SPS, very tiny machine, a lot of graphic, vector graphic and all that. So, so there is a, a lot of advancement because of the computer, computational resources simply getting better, right? And not just the CPU, right? You are asking, they also GPU, uh, latest people have been using GPU for a while. We actually have a lot of people who work on computational problem and go work for NVIDIA. My husband is currently a, a, a senior, uh, and software engineer and Nvidia because he was so much on GPU and then they snatch him to work on something else. Um, right, and so and so our our field having have a long tradition to work with people uh, 
to improve our algorithm as well. So QCD, it's hard, not just analytically and all the other problems, right? Computationally, there are also a lot of non-trivial problems that we want to have to overcome. So in principle, yes, I can just take a code and put it on a lot more advanced computer and hopefully it will work and it will, but you still don't get all the speed up you can, right? We always want to, if you can finish a calculation in one year, why do you want to wait for 10 years? I want to do it in one year. We want result fresh and quick. And so, and thanks to a lot of our, some of our people who really talk to, you know, computer scientists, applied mathematicians. So they actually get a lot of interesting ideas from those fields. And sometimes they dig up field that's I, I don't know, 80 years ago. It used to be a bad idea because they don't have the right computer. And now it's like awesome that we work like, work like magic. So a lot of our, uh, so we are able to do like about physical power mass about 10 years ago because of that kind of advancement, like another factor of 10 increase and, and on top of the, uh, the latest hardware. So that's a, another lesson if you don't get anything what I'm talking about, right? They lay out a lot of course interdisciplinary things going on that can really help your research. Yes. I love what you said about quantum computing, that that's where we are today with, with quantum computing. Do you think like in 40 or 50 years, Wei Wen Yu, that we're gonna, be, we're gonna have these pictures or will it be faster? So that's a very good question, right? Are we, that's what some of my colleagues were saying that, you know, look at where we are 20 years ago, right? But where we are now. So they think the quantum computing will probably get there as well. So it, it depends on who you ask. I think people give you different uh, answers to that question. Personally, I don't know. Uh, so I, I actually got asked yesterday about, can we solve, put latest QCD on quantum computer directly? And like, the question is not so uh, direct. It's, it's not like so easy, right? They are something that classical computer can do very well, right? We can do scalar, Feel really quickly, so that's something. So we a lot of trick we do is change the Fermiani field to Bosoni field because that's something we can do very quickly, and you, and then you transfer them back, right? And so with the quantum computing, is the opposite, right? Okay. So it's hard to, so it's interesting. It's hard to put a fermion on the classical computing, and but it's hard to put field on quantum <laughs> quantum computing. So you need know to really think about. But yeah. there's local efforts here in nuclear physics theory, Professor Harzeev, there's local efforts to mm -hmm. put a QCG on the quantum computer. So far we have a small one, but hopefully with time it will work. Yeah. We join, join up with BNL. Yeah. It's Harzeev. Yeah. Do you have interruption? No, that's okay. There, there are some, some of the people thinking about maybe instead of doing quantum computing, you do just use the universal quantum computing, but you can also do simulation, right? Where I can, there are people doing that I own track. So you put your theory, you know, you can put your fermions aligned with specific, you know, uh, problem you want to solve. And some people think that have a more near-term uh, promises on solving some of the problem. But it really depends on the specific problem though. Yeah. This is very helpful because now I understand why people talk about quantum computing and they all are digging into holographic light front QCD because it has a supersymmetry between fermions and bosons in QCD. But now I understand why people care about that, like quantum computing and lattice people care because it's it's going in between fermions and bosons, like you said. Right. Thank you. Okay. All right. So I'm going to way behind what I have played. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, so, so what do you need to, you know, do a latest calculation, right? If you, any of you are interested. Um, so one thing, you, one first, you, you, you need some kind of computational resources, the hardware, and there are various places that you can get them. Um, so at the, I, with the, I'm, I'm, in the US, we have a collaboration called USQCD. So together we form a collaboration and we have some proposal. We return to DOE, uh, ask a, advanced computation and we get some hardware. So here's one of the picture from uh, Fermilab. We got some cluster for latest people only. And we also use the money to find, find people who help us to uh, speed up the code, right? So because hardware keep changing. So today AMD have this, and then tomorrow NVIDIA do that, right? And physics, we just want to do physics problems. So for me, that's it for me. I just want to do physics problems. I don't want to think about that. And But some of those money that highly higher 
someone that who are interested in doing those, they want they, they, they are interested in getting speed up and all kinds of new hardware. And so they like doing that. So it's a perfect marriage for uh, the physics that got to do physics by, by having them supporting people who speed, do a lot of specialized hardware code to make things go faster on um, whatever the next machine are coming up, right? So that's a very nice collaboration. And they are also, and then we also got some hardware for calculations. And now NSF uh, and DOE both funding a number of different facilities. And here I'll just show you one of the example of, so this is from the Texas uh, Computing Center. And they, they always name their computer something to do with the cloud. So this is the key. <laughs> and then the stories is called Ranger and, and all that, which is really cute. And then uh, this is a uh, machine at Berkeley Lab uh, in NERSC. And this is Corey, just retired yesterday. I love this machine. And so what they, they think is to name the computer after a uh, scientist. So they try to alternate male, female scientists. I've been using Corey for a long time. So I have a sentiment of that. And yeah, so, so you can write proposal. Uh, and usually a more a larger scale proposal, you need some faculty to be on board. But the NSF now changed to uh, Access, they do have student proposal that you, as a student, you can submit a proposal to get some computer time and, and then do some small scale calculation. If that works, then you can find some other faculty to sponsor you to be a bigger one and so on. So it's actually quite nice. And when I was students so long ago, uh, I was doing a problem that nobody else in the group was interested in. So I actually had to put together uh, computer myself to do my thesis. So this is my machine. Uh, so they were experience, my group was experiencing this hot new hardware and that later become IBM Bujing. I don't know anyone heard about that. It was a really big thing that IBM came to compute uh, high performance computer game because this collaboration with my professor, uh, my thesis advisor, but nobody else wanted to touch it at the time the group because they have another machine that worked very well. And, and I'm the only one who, I, I need to do a lot of calculation to, to tune some parameters. And so I had to put together uh, this little board myself. So you, you get whatever you can and you what you need to do to get your thesis done, right? And then there are also community software, right? So the USQT, I said, right? We also share a lot of software and there are different labels. So this is just a picture taken from this website, right? A lot of them are on GitHub, you can download them. And so they are some of the fundamental, like fundamental uh, sources on different way of doing parallel computing. And then on the top label, there are different collaboration have their own preference of how they like to write the physics code and different, different branches have different specialized or the fermion action. Like I mentioned, right, we have, we have, to, we have more than one fermion action we can write down for the, because we are working in discretized space time. So we have very different fermion actions to write it down. So, um, so the CPS is good for, they have a very specialized code uh, working on something called domain wall fermion action, which is a fermion action that preserves chiral symmetry on the finite data spacing. It's really expensive, but if you, uh, you work on um, some problem like pions and kions, uh, decay, uh, major Solomon, you need a lot of those symmetry to simplify your lie, otherwise you break the symmetry, you have to missing with too many operators, you don't want to deal with that, right? And then the male collaboration famous using something called Steger fermions. So they have a lot of specialized code there and so on. And Quoma is a more general purpose. They got a little bit of everything and uh, a lot of people are using them as well, right? So this is something that you can download directly. And there are also some of the online tutorial available. Um, just uh, they used to be video associated with the summer school I organized, but now they IMT so <laughs> decide to discontinue and all there. So they used to use Alcobag, yeah, with all the recording. We spent a lot of time recording all the lecture. And after the school was over, I think that there are a lot of people using the, the video to learn how to uh, do latest QZ calculations. So some of you were asking how to. How do you learn more about latest QCD if you're interested? And this is where I usually point them to. But now, now we only have slides, the videos are gone, fortunately. Yeah. Uh, but there is another summer school. And, uh, it's last, uh, more recently, and then you can find some of the playlists here. It might be more on the theoretical side of, um, in this case. All right. 
And then second thing you need is a QC mapping, right? Like say that this is one of those very complicated thing. You need you always start need to start from the ground state, right? Ground state is lacking. This is what latest people call gauge computation, right? And so what it does because it's keep moving, right? And so we have we don't really equip to do that as a physics, right? You always been told to do certain algorithmic problem and so on, right? So what we do is actually is to capture those movie friends. It's like you making a movie, right? You, you know how to take pictures from my friend, right? So we do exactly the same thing. We take pictures of the, the this complicated QCD vacuums, right? And we just take a lot of pictures. Right, and like the same thing as if we, as you watch a movie, right? There's this if your friend is close enough, you will have very nice moving picture. Your friend's not so close enough, you, you might have very different thing that you have to consider, right? So we do exactly the same thing, right? So this is just basically uh, we say some of this configuration, right? Now we have the backing to stop with our calculation, right? And then there's obviously a lot of complicated thing going on here as well. Uh, this is where you often see latest people have bigger uh, collabor uh, really long order list compared with other theories work because uh, doing things like this actually take a long time. Backing itself doesn't have very interesting physics. <laughs> they have people already write all the paper they can. So there's really nothing else to, to talk about. So, and so there's uh, always some collabor collaboration between somebody who do this kind of calculation and combine with people who do other uh, different physics observables. And then, and some of this actually can be downloaded online, actually. So people have been working on an international latest data grid. So they can actually try like everything else today, you can download online. And okay, sorry. Anyway, so this is the map, it doesn't work out. So they are a diff they have a different hub around different continents, so you can download. A lot of latest is that people already kind of use and share online as well. So they are thinking you can do that. And there are occasionally you want to do specific calculation. For example, when I was posted at Jepson Lab, we are really interested in study resonances and you really require very, very fine resolution in time, right? And so we had to kind of spend a few years learning how to generate those as well. So again, you, your physics tend to drive you on what you need to do, how dirty your hand had to be, and, and so on. So you do what you have to do. And then after you've done all that, then the rest of them slightly easier, right? So you take a, you got your vacuum, and then now you start to think about what kind of physics you want to do. Say, I want to study the masses of the photon, right? So I will put, a proton somewhere in space time. So this is like a whole dimension of time and that dimension is S, Y, Z. And so this is where you need some of those supercomputers as well, because you need to convert huge max rand metric of the device output to matrix, right? Then you calculate something called propagator, right? And that propagator give you, uh, give you some of the space time dependence and then use that space time dependence you can study the pion, uh, the, the masses of different quantities, right? And then it's more complicated than that. You had to have the right quantum numbers in general. They are you have called the degree of freedom, speed degree of freedom, and then you put out the momentum as well, so that you get to the right quantum number of the topic you are interested in. Right. And so, for example, and if you are interested in proton, they are simple way that you can write down a proton operator, right? You put it on the computer. All right, and then it will give you something associated with the right quantum numbers. The simplest thing to do is the pi on, right? The pi on pi plus, for example, is easy to do. And, and so on. So these are this is uh, just some example of what you can do, but that they are not unique. You can write down many, many operators, right? Um, that associate with the specific quantum numbers. Right. Then the next step you need to do is start to analyze it. Either you want you are interested in masses or couplings. In this case, I'm showing the example for mass, right? So you have 
the jet here, sorry for the notation, is the interpreter's operator, right? So I say, I'm interested in studying nuclear. So I put in an operator I showed in the previous page, right? In, in my vacuum, right? So the vacuum means vacuum. So I create one and analyze one in specific time, right? And, but that particular operator can be, because I just put it there, right? The, all your physics will pick up all the possible, the same, I get any eigenstate that correspond to the same quantum number. So you end up with uh, something more than just one simple behave, uh, quantity you want, you actually sum up with a bunch of possible eigenstate as well, right? And, and then, um, so then, then they can try to study the time dependence on that. That's how we get the masses, right? And so you can try to fit the correlators and sometimes we like to visualize how well we fit the data, right? Because chi-square is not always the most reliable thing. Sometimes they tell you useful information, sometimes they don't. The correlator, because we have this exponential decay, so it actually vary by magnitude. So we can't just do regular low plot. That's the, the time gets really large. Uh, you can change it magnitude of 20 and that's something that's not quite visible. So typically latest people will use something called effective mass plot. So supposedly, if I don't worry, I only worry about the ground state, right? Assuming the ground state, which is zero here, that dominates, right? So this is just a very simple exponential term, right? And so I can, um, so I can do something by only interested in getting the mass and the energy out here, or if it's momentum equal to zero, that's the mass. I can do a simple natural law function, and that should give me a good approximation of the bond state masses. And this is kind of what we see in here. So you have Euclidean time and the energy itself. And so at the larger time, you see at the larger time, because the psychic state always have much larger energy, right? The ground state has smallest energy. So at the larger time, you're gonna see the, the data point will be dominating by the ground state. So you see something that's kind of plateau at the end, but earlier time, because the the, the time is small, the energy difference is not so obvious. So you, you see some contamination of the excited state. Yes. Uh, previous slide, what, what is U and A stand? Like when you write pion fields, can you? Oh, oh sorry. U is for U quark, D for D quark, and then the gamma are the, 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 mat like the, the orange marriage matrices. Yeah, and then you have A, 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 A B, a, B, C are the, the color indexes. And delta, wait a minute, delta, sub delta? The sub delta or the ups? Uh, uh, I think it's, uh, okay, that's a good question. I think it's corresponding to different, so the delta itself have a lot more possible spin. They have different spin. I think that corresponding to different, different spin. Yeah. So delta is a complicated part of the all right, it's actually, okay. So here is the, oh, sorry, <laughs> exercise one. So uh, try to think about deriving, so the homework for tonight, I guess, uh, try to derive this relationship, right? So it's easier to start with the pion. You can think about pion, it's much easier. And then you can then, they can uh, then, once you're familiar with that, you can try with the nuclear. And another exercise is, so, so what we're trying to do, we try to play here, this is something called effective mass plot, right? And there are other ways to define it, right? Can you find, and then can you find a different way to kind of try to get the first excited state instead of regular in the bond state? Right, so some algebra here. Right, okay. What are the J and in the previous page, what? <laughs> So J here is a in, in what we call interpreting operator, right? So we can put an operator that say I, I want I'm interested in protons, so I can have an operator composed by three quarks like I showed earlier, right? Three quarks, certain color structure, right? And then that give you the spin one half, right? So that's basically what I do, right? And to do this exercise, you actually don't need to know that much about the the, the operator itself, right? Other than the particle itself. It does, does it carry spin zero or spin one half? And I'll give you slightly different uh, decomposition rules. 
And the last thing, like uh, many of the scientific studies, we need to talk about systematic uncertainty, which is why we spend a lot of time thinking about that, right? Because latest QCD is supposed to be a better way of getting more precise number that uh, you can get it elsewhere. On the quantity, we know how to calculate. And so in, in addition to the, you had to worry about some of this non-zero latest spacing and finite A all show something that's been uh, proven that's not, uh, dependence on those, right? So one thing I do want to propagate is that now all latest QCD number calculation could be reliable, right? They are, uh, so this is a, a logo from before I studied latest QCD calculation, the uh, latest components in Florida. This is their components logo. <laughs> but since then I have been using this to warn everybody like this etiquette to living inside the latest, right? <laughs> so you are not careful, like, like experiment, right? I know a lot of you are experimentalists here. Right, you can get wrong number if you don't do your analysis very carefully. Same thing with the latest QCD. Sometimes people have too much faith on everyone. Uh, like experiment, right? Not all experiment. I mean, some experiment more reliable, right? Some special may not have all the systematic studies, so you might want to take it with a grain of salt. Same thing with the latest calculation, right? You want to be, you want to, you want to check them and make sure people study them. So to remove that, what I call removing the monster inside the latest, and that's where the number you, you should be trusting, right? Oh, let's talk to them about what they have been looking at. Right, and so they are lab limits. And let's show you a couple of examples that people have done this before, right? So this was done by, a European collaboration from three institutes, they make it nicely into BMW, that everybody remember them very well. Uh, so this is something they do a, long, a while ago uh, in 2008. At the time that doing multiple latest spacing is rare. And so they are not doing anything too complicated. They are just studying the basic two point, um, what we call, the, what latest people literally call the low hanging fruit, but they do it in a lot of precisions. So the error bar are all very small and they do it in multiple, a lot of pile masses, different latest spacing, and they do a continuous extrapolation to the, what we call physical uh, limit, right? And we're not making into a science article and sorry. Right, and so, so here's basically what they know. So one thing I didn't mention is, so we, we do have to tune the quant masses on the latest calculation, right? So we find a way to set the latest spacing. From there, we had to kind of decide what our quant masses are. We actually using the input, commonly using the pi m mass input, uh, we to tune the pi m masses, uh, quant masses, and, and the k m to tune the strange quant masses. So that we, use, we need some input from experiments to tune those quant mass parameters. And then everything else, then we can carry on using the correct operators. Then you can kind of calculate some of this very simple hydrogen spectroscopy, right? So this is what's done in 2008. And what's because the first time anybody done this, even though they are, you probably know them from the particle data book. Yeah, okay. So yeah, so the bar here is from the particle data book, right? So it's all kind of known, so actually a post-diction, but because nobody have done that before and they make it to science, yeah, as well. 20 years ago, right? But generally, there are a lot of things like that you can do. They are actually prediction power in the latest QCD calculations. Um, so here's a, a couple of examples that I did with uh, a great student at University of Washington at the time, who is now faculty at Berkeley. Uh, so at the time, we are looking at something called high-on high -on scattering calculation. So basically, instead of single high that like you saw, you have a high-on high -on range in the right quantum numbers you can see. And so we were able to, the experiment haven't been able to reproduce for a long time. So they have really large error bar and they were a bunch of uh, latest calculation uh, try to do exactly such a calculation, right? So we can do something that's better than experiment who cannot be, haven't been repeated for a long time. So there's uh, some prediction powers. And then we were also looking at something called count variance by spectroscopy, and that's before the LHCB start to reporting a lot of interesting uh, hydrogen spectroscopy at the time. But at the time, right, we don't, we are able to reproduce some of the, the bar here is taken from particle data book. The blue point here is our calculation. And here just integrate a number of different kind of uh, charm barrier. If, play, if you play my content three game, you will find out what they are. <laughs> anyway, so we are able to make some of the prediction at the time. And, and now it's, 
we haven't re this is back in 2012. Now we probably have some real experimental measurement that we can compare that. So, but just things like that, you can make prediction, even though it's not a very complicated calculation, but something that easier for latest to do at the time experiment wasn't available. And there are things like uh, bottom, uh, bottom very young as well. I'm going to skip that. Uh, I'm running really late. Okay, I'm just going to talk a little bit about this and then I will stop. So I mentioned things like um, there are more there are more than one way to write down an operator, right? So for example, for nucleons, right, for spin one half baryons, right, you can have three quarks, right? And then you put it in one particular location, you can write down actually multiple type of operator that corresponding to the same quantum number, right? But um I was trying to look for particle data book before then. When I was a grad student, I used to get like one giant book. I think this big. I couldn't find a picture. Nobody had them anymore, right? <laughs> they are so big, they had to give you another smaller bullet so you can find all the particles. And you wanted all the detail is in this huge book that uh, is two people the backpack, right? We used to have those and they list all the particles that ever been observed. And then because there are so many of them, so they start to, some of them, uh, be repeatedly seen by other experiments, some of them only been seen by one places. So they kind of random them in different star, depends on how reliable they are and all that. So if you look at that, uh, so here I only list like the four star state, right? They are actually quite a number of them, right? And there's so many of them, right? And then doing the calculation is really not easy to, to do so. So you had to kind of have to really spread out uh, the operator basis to, to really be able to pick up all these different quantum numbers on the calculation, right? So, so this is actually being traced back to early 2000s. Uh, that a group of people uh, that were really interested in solving some of these hard, hard on space chalk problems, right? So <laughs> what you can do is you can, so because we have all these different lazy spacing, right? You can put the quad in different location, right? And then uh, you can put quad in various different orientation and we like it to be, shorter distance because if you get farther away, the latest calculation get noisy as well. So we try to keep them as short as possible, right? And then you can start to having all this complicated combination and they can correspond into, uh, because we play the rotational symmetry. So now you are kind of dealing with the different uh, part, particular groups and combination of that can give you various different uh, spin numbers. Uh, so the, the gist is that this is something that can be done. It's a lot more complicated. You can end up with hundreds of operators that give you the right quantum numbers and there are specific patterns. Uh, if you want to find out more about that, you can click on the YouTube video here. And then you can do all that analysis and do the calculations. All right, um, I think I'm going to stop here. I didn't get as far as I want to go, but I would take a few questions then. <laughs> Clover action. Oh, good question. Um, right. Clover, clover action is one of the uh, familiarity, uh, uh, familiarity action that we use in the latest calculation. So, so if you start with, so when we discretize the latest, right, the, the standard Dirac uh, equation, right, that would give us a few of the what we call doubling problems. Right, because we have, right. And then so, so clever, so that one way to do that is to break some symmetry. So Wilson introduced this Wilson turn at dimension five that fixed that problem. Mm -hmm. um, but, but it also create, it made the, what we call discretization effect much larger, right? So what we do is that like, like good all latest is right, you start doing the dimensional counting. Then you, okay, that's all the dimension five you can write down, right? Then you work on the dimension six and then you use that dimension six operator to, to cancel out some of the artifact. And when the turn turned out look like a, a look like a globally because you including the, the, uh, the fields, that work around that. So the name is just called Clover Action. Yeah. Um, um, so can you go back to the slide with um, the octahedral symmetry? The um, slides. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, is there any research on different shaped lattices, like a 
hexagonal or triangular? And does that change the calculations? Or can you show that it doesn't matter which lattice you use? That's a very good question, actually. People have been thinking about that. So one of the one of the early research people did, did is to uh, to solve this double problem, right? Another there are multiple ideas that have been proposed, right? Uh, so any of the regular lattices will, will create some sort, if it's not doubling, you, you will always have extra copy because of the periodic nature, right? So people come up with this clever, some people come up with this clever idea. So we don't do regular lattices that do random lattices, right? If you break that repetitivity, then you don't have those uh, additional copies of the answer you don't want. And turn out that boy, I think confinement or something, so it's even worse. And so, so, um, so the square lattice kind of stay. There are a couple of people try to think about Hasgano lattices when back in the time, I'm not sure you guys all know. <laughs> so there was a time people were really crazy about graphing simulations and a lot of lattice people uh, just kind of expand their rectangular code to uh, the hexagonal uh, simulation, and they do a bunch of two-dimensional calculation. Turn out you can write paper way faster than doing for these simulations. <laughs> and there was a, so people have done that. And some people were started to think, there are people who try to do hexagonal simulation to solve some of the uh, beyond standard model problem, right? Um, so there are some, there's a list, person from Boston University who would like to think about mathematical questions. And he was he was playing around a bunch of hexagonal lattices and find it might be, he only do it in the low dimension, right? Like I say, we always try to reduce the codes when we play around things. He was doing like two, three, 2D or 3D, I think. And so he was doing, uh, I think it was good for some of the other people that he's interested in for the answer the model. But most of the QCD people do, um, rectangular, yeah. Can I, can I read that, that, that part to say that the smaller lattice spacing, like the blues, are they more realistic? Like the naive expect, expectation, is it? Yeah, so generally, yes. We If we if there's only one lattice spacing, we will say, we will, I will probably trust this case, you know, using exactly the same setup, this calculation is likely more reliable, right? And, but, so, but, you know, given we have, uh, even this calculation have done three different lattice spacing, we can extrapolate that to A equal to zeros. That A equal to zero is a better answer than A equal to point of six. Yeah. And then, um, yeah. Um, one can show that spontaneous symmetry breaking, like, is possible only if you have infinite system. Right. If, the, if the space of your system goes to infinity, because otherwise you cannot localize those states in the Mexican hat potential. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking. Ah. There is a theorem you can prove that it, like proper spontaneous symmetry breaking can happen only if your system is infinite, because other, otherwise you cannot localize your states in Mexican hat potential, stuff like that. Can be the, the issue here. Because in QCD, sometimes we also treat pions as, as goldstone bosons and um, can it so affect your computations. Thanks. I, well, okay. So, so they are QCD theory or models that they use the, the pion, more like treat pion like a, a, a boson that propagating forces, right? But it, it's not what we do here, right? So what our, our degree of freedom is quarks and gluon. Right, so uh, so whatever things that we did, uh, that that's actually closer to to what we. Uh, I, I don't know the first principle is the right words or anything. It, it depends on the the physics you are, you are study, right? So in our case, we we are really good at doing something what we call single hadron calculations, right? So because we can put the proton cell together quite easily, you just require three parts, right? It does come with a price though. When we started want to study, I didn't have time to go over. There's a a lot of people study, try to study nuclei using latest QCD. And that become more problematic because now you start putting say cis quadrile object on the latest, right? And you become actually really noisy numerically just based on some of the setup we have. And so, so in those cases that they are, you know, usually, usually either use special trick to try to get some of the physics out, or you have to stay at very heavy core masses, right? So, so we have a lot of those nuclei calculation, but they are like 300 AV, 400 AV. So it's not 
quite close to what you'd like to directly compare uh, with the experiment yet. Yeah, but that gives us some uh, ideas. So people are usually looking at that to see what are the nuclear effects, right? So say I, at, the, at this 400 AV universe, how much of like, adding the nuclear, how that changed the certain property, like say actual coupling constant, right? With the one nucleon, two nucleon, three nucleon, four nucleon, how that changed. That might give us some hint about how we treat them in the real world, but it's not one thing that you can directly implement. All right, yeah. that's thanks, Stephen. Yes.